we doing? Are we good? We're with it? Wow, thank you guys this morning. Off to a great start. And uh, I, I, this is, I don't know if you guys know this or not, this is the third time I've been here this year, so I don't feel like a guest anymore. And you guys have made me feel welcome, so thank you for doing that. If you are, okay. That just means if you're not telling Pastor Matt that the chances are I may come back again in the future. But, uh, um, so if you are a guest, hey, thanks for jumping in today. Um, you have found a very safe place to hear potentially a very dangerous message. And this is a safe group of people, and uh, you can explore that here. But who's ready to uh, hear today and receive a word from God that I think comes right out of his scripture today? Okay, awesome. And it's going to be challenging, so I don't know. Are we ready for that? All right, awesome. Well, a few years ago, I was feeling uh, particularly led to intentionally get out of my comfort zone. And so I um, hang out with a lot of the same people in the same places. I do a lot of the same things. I thought, let me just do something. I'm going to go into the community that I live in. And my wife and I live in Garner. We've lived there for, um, I don't know, how long we lived there? Uh, 10, 10 years, probably? Yeah, we've lived there 10 years. And so a few years ago, I thought, you know, I'm going to join this basketball league that is Garner-specific. A lot of times I play in Apex or Cary. I'm going to play in Garner. And uh, I come to find out you can only sign up as an individual. You can't be on a team. And I thought, well, this is perfect. I'm just going to roll in there by myself. I don't know anybody, and I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to join the basketball team. And so everybody's coming in by themselves. That's exactly what I'm looking for. So I go online, I sign up, and then there's this option that says, would you like to attend the live draft? And I thought, well, this, this is too good to pass up. I, I have to go to the live draft. And so uh, I show up, and everybody's in the community center, and I want the full experience, right? And so the way the draft works is the eight coaches are standing on the court, and then the 80 players are sitting. This is exactly how you did it in grade school, right? The 80 players are sitting in the stands, or some of them are hiding by the exits because they want to be uh, chosen by a particular coach. Eight coaches... 80 players in the stands, and, and here's the way the draft works. So they had predetermined the order, and then just one at a time, the first coach goes, I'll take that dude over there. And then you come out, and you stand by the guy. And I thought, oh, man, this is bringing back a lot of bad memories, right? You guys, you guys are thinking fifth grade, right, kickball on the playground. I understand that. And so I just want you to know the breakdown of those 80 players, okay? 70 black or African-American eight white and two girls and the two girls are there because they had played division one basketball okay so they got they got invited in on this whole deal and so it's obvious to me that there are a lot of existing relationships right because they would call guys by name and i know my guys over there because he's you can't see him, he's hiding in the doorway, but I got him, he's on my team. And then one by one, people are coming out here and they're taking players. And so somewhere around the 75th pick, one of the coaches points to me and he goes, we'll take that dude right there. We'll take that dude. And it's just me and a couple other people sitting up here in the bleachers, right? And so number nine pick, the final person for our particular team, guess who was number eight? One of the girls. All right, one of the girls is number eight. And, and so I show up to the very first game, and we only have six players that night for the very first game. And we're standing around in a huddle, and the coach picks himself and three other guys. All right, so we're up to four. And then he turns to me and to the girl. And his eyes are going back and forth like this. And he goes, hey, man, why don't you come off the bench tonight, all right? <laughs> so he chooses this girl, and he puts her into the starting lineup. And so... That was my experience for the whole season, okay? And, and it did exactly what I wanted it to do and to accomplish. And we all probably have some stories like this one. Anybody remember a story like that before? Where maybe you're the one who's been in the margins, so to speak, right? Anybody ever been excluded from something? You were not picked. You were not asked to join, right? You, it was a school group. It was something like a sports team. It was an in crowd, and, and you were not part of it. And not only do we know how that feels, here's where it gets really, really dangerous for some of us is we carry that over sometimes into our relationship and the way that we feel about God or we think the way God feels about us. Because maybe we have done some bad things in our life or maybe we do consider ourselves to be weak or we're poor 
Or maybe God just wants to push us away too. On the other side, maybe we're the ones who have been people who have pushed people to the margins, right? We have excluded people. And for whatever reason, they're just not up to our level, right? They don't get accepted. They don't get uh, worthy. Uh, they don't get included. And even though we follow Jesus, again, here's where it gets really dangerous as to carry it over spiritually. Even though maybe we follow Jesus, the kind of thinking gets carried with us where we draw lines of acceptance, right? Or maybe not intentionally, but we certainly aren't going out of our way to make sure people who are marginalized actually feel included and loved. What I want us to do today is to hang out in a story that Jesus is a part of, all right? Real experience for Jesus. You can read about it in um, Luke chapter 14. But what it does is it communicates what I think are two really great, big, all-important ideas. And here they are. Is that God's heart is for people who are in the margins. And he wants his followers, right? He wants his followers who love him to love the people that he loves. And so I think I can boil it down to one sentence that maybe you all can remember. Would you just look at this up here on the screen? It's that when we include those who are excluded, we love like God loves. Would you guys just read that with me this morning loud and strong? Can we do that together? Can we? Who, whoever said yes, we'll do it together. All right, here we go. Can we just do that? When we include people who are excluded, we love like and when I say Jesus loves people in the margins, I want to be clear as we jump into the story. We're talking about the forgotten. We're talking about the lowly, the cast aside, those who get labeled less than in our society. But not only did Jesus love those people, that's where he lived for most of his life, isn't it? And the way that he valued and cared for people who were excluded oftentimes put him at odds with the religious in crowd, okay? So it's an interesting scenario. As a matter of fact, one of the most common questions when you read through the Gospels, one of the most common questions that Jesus is asked by people is essentially this. Jesus, why do you hang out with those people? <laughs> and that's the question really that is happening in our story today. And his, his answer is always very, very simple. Well, those people are the reason that I came. So when you get to Luke chapter 14, if you've got a Bible, it's on the screen, on your phone, whatever. There are four biographers of Jesus, right? Four people tell his story, Matthew, Mark, Luke, John. Luke is the only one who actually includes this story. So here we go. Luke 14, one Sabbath day, Jesus went to eat dinner in the home of a leader of the Pharisees. And the people were watching him closely. There was a man there whose arms and legs were swollen. And I just want to stop there because there's so many important things to the whole story to understand right here. Pharisees, right? If we don't know this, the religious in crowd, right? They think they're the best of the best. They are the included ones, the in crowd. And the leader of the group invites Jesus over to his place to have dinner. These are the most important guys of the in crowd who get invited to the dinner. They think they're a really big deal. Now, when Jesus gets invited to dinners like this, it's usually a setup, right? He's being set up for something. They want to watch his every move, right? They want to see if they can catch him doing something that's forbidden by their laws. So, side note, all right? When Jesus accepts typically a dinner invitation from people, it's usually so he can hang out with people who first century Jews legally would forbid you to mingle with. Okay, he's intentional about what he does, whether that's a beggar, a tax collector, prostitutes, a sick person, a dying person, sinners, right? This category of sinners that were culturally and religiously off limits. So he's usually picking for very specific reasons. And who just happens to be hanging outside at this particular dinner? A sick guy. Now, depending on what your version of the Bible, how it reads, he has a condition that's known as dropsy, right? So he retains water. He has, uh, his body is swollen. It would be difficult for him to move. It's a very slow, very painful way for a person to die. So picture this, all right, and we'll go forward. You have the religious elite are on the inside at the party, while those who are hurting and those who are marginalized are outside the house looking in, all right? And so they're sitting down to dinner. Here's the conversation, verse 3. Jesus asked the Pharisees and the experts in religious law this question. Is it permitted in the law to heal people on the Sabbath day or not? When they refused to answer, Jesus decides to go ahead and do it anyway. 
touches the sick man and healed him and then sent him away. Then he turned to them and said, which of you doesn't work on the Sabbath? I mean, honestly, if your son or your cow falls into a pit, don't you rush out to get him out? Again, they could not answer, right? Now, now back off again for a second because you, you got the Sabbath, right? The day of rest, Sabbath day of rest, right? We all know the Sabbath. We've heard about the Sabbath, right? We need a day off every week, right? And, and we're really good to do that, aren't we? Okay, we're not so good on that particular one, but you've got to understand, right, it's something God, to put, something God put into motion, right, from the very beginning. He created things for six days and then rested on the seventh. So he said, hey, people, you should work for six days and then rest on the seventh, just as a reminder on the fact that you can't do everything, right? Just rest. Rest on the seventh. Sounds good, doesn't it? Well, the Pharisees decided to take that to a whole nother level, and they added rules upon rules upon rules on what they considered and what was counted as a violation of work. So healing, by the way, is, is definitely working if you're a pastor or a rabbi like Jesus, right? So that's off limits. There's no healing, right? So Jesus asks, hey, did you guys happen to see the guy who was outside by the front door? Anybody see that guy out there by the front door? What do you guys think? Should I heal him? Would that be a good way to start this dinner party? Now, if they say no, think about the implications. If they say no, well, then they're just uh, they're cold, they're heartless, they, they show that they actually really don't care about people. If they say, well, yeah, go ahead, well, then the dinner's a waste of time, right? Because then we can't, we can't pin everything here on Jesus, so they don't say anything. Jesus takes that to mean it's okay. He says to the sick man, you want to be healed? Well, of course you want to be healed. You're healed. Now get out of here. It's about to get ugly in here. That's, I think that's the way that reads right there. <laughs> now, picture this again. They haven't eaten yet. We haven't, we haven't had hors d'oeuvres, no appetizers. And Jesus is pushing harder, and he's throwing out some hypothetical questions. Look at this. Hey, think about this, guys. If your kid goes out for a bike ride... And it's on the Sabbath, and, and he falls into a hole. Are you guys going to go help him or not? Are you going to roll out there and say, Ah, sorry, son, you'll have to wait till tomorrow. <laughs> no, none of you are going to do that. And understand, Jesus, he's, he's setting the table, right, to fully explain how he feels about people. Now, picture this again, right? The whole dinner party is silent. There's this awkward feeling, I'm sure, and Jesus keeps pushing. Read verse 7. It says this. When Jesus noticed that all who had come to the dinner were trying to sit in the seats of honor near the head of the table, he gave them this advice, unsolicited, right? Hey, when you're invited to a wedding feast, don't sit in the seat of honor. What if someone who's more distinguished than you has also been invited. A, a thought that I'm sure had never crossed their minds. Someone could be a more important. The host will come and say, give this person your seat. Then you'll be embarrassed. You'll have to take whatever seat is left at the foot of the table. Instead, here, here, how about this? Take the lowest place at the foot of the table. Then when your host sees you, he'll come and say, friend, we have a better place for you. And then you'll be honored in front of all the other guests. For those who exalt themselves will be humbled, and those who humble themselves will be exalted. How many of you have ever heard that last line before? Right? It's interesting to see the story in which Jesus says that, isn't it? Now understand, normally at a dinner party like this one, you would have assigned seats. But the way Jesus makes it sound is like a junior high cafeteria, right? You open the doors, everybody runs and scrambles and, and, and tries to get the very best seats in the very best groups, right? Now, typically, you understand that, that the setting for a dinner like this would be like a, a very low, a low table, probably about two feet off the ground. They would have pillows around this thing, and you would eat your dinner the way that I used to watch TV when I was younger. You lay on the floor on one elbow like this, and you just eat like this. So they would be reclining. That, that's the way it typically works. And there would be a seating chart, right? There would be a seating chart. And the way it works is the most important person would sit on the right hand of the host. And then the second most important person on the left. 
and then third, fourth. So there's definitely an organized seating chart that they would typically be using. And, and Jesus is looking at these grown men, all right, who are likely wearing these long, flowing robes, right? Uh, they're pushing each other, and they're kind of jockeying for best seats, and he uses an interesting illustration. Now, it, it, we're kind of coming up on the wedding season. Who's been to a wedding recently? All right, we went, wow, okay. I, I go to a ton of weddings, all right? We went to one two weeks ago. I think I actually officiated six just last year. So I, I, I've done a lot of weddings. I've been to a lot of weddings. And I've seen people come in sometimes and not know where to sit. You ever done that? You're like, well, I, I don't know. That way? Do I go that way? And I've even seen someone come in before walk down front and sit in the first row. And I'm going, that is not going to work. That, that is not your seat. You don't belong. That is grandma's seat. You can't go sit in grandma's seat right there. And they do it in front of everyone. And then an usher has to come from the back, walk down there and say, hey, you have got to move. Grandma is coming and she can't wait much longer. You're in grandma's seat. You're going to have to move and get going. She's 90 and she has a walker, so you cannot sit in grandma's seat. And it's a bit humbling because you can only sit there and go, okay, I am an idiot. What am I doing in grandma's seat? And now you're in the video, right? And, and, and every time the, they watch the wedding or talk about that day, they'll go like this. Remember that one guy? Like, what, what was his name? I don't remember, but what an idiot, right? He was... Listen, that is exactly what Jesus is saying. He's saying, hey, go ahead and sit in the back. And when they notice you and you're an important family member, they're going to ask you to move up. And then you get to walk past all these other people and say, yeah, I'm a very close friend of the family. They'll honor you. What, what Jesus is trying to say is, you guys, you only care about yourselves at the expense of other people. You're in here and you're fighting over these seats and there are people who are outside who are hurting and they're sick and they're in need. And if you keep trying to promote yourself, there will come a time when God will humble you. See, that's the way it works in Jesus' economy. If we could just pull back for a second. It's the people who only think of themselves and who are always trying to get ahead. They will eventually be humbled. See, on the other hand, what Jesus is saying is, okay, people who are living their lives for others... Right? You're living it for other people. You eventually get promoted. So what if you did this, right? What if you could actually start humble and view the world as a level playing field and try to put other people first? Then God would exalt you. Back to the dinner, right? Jesus speaking to the host. I'm still not sure if they've eaten anything yet, and they're all really, really mad. And Jesus says, hey, let, let me give you a real-time example. Verse 12, he turned to his host. When you put on a luncheon or a banquet like this one, don't invite your friends, your brothers, your relatives, and rich neighbors. They will invite you back. That's what they do. And they'll be your only reward. Instead, invite the poor, the crippled, the lame, and the blind. Then, at the resurrection of the righteous, God will reward you for inviting those who could not repay you. Now, he's saying a lot right there, isn't he? Remember, again, Jesus is the guest. He's the only person in this entire story that's recorded as speaking, right, during the entire dinner. You have to understand just how offensive this probably is. He's looking at this group of guys who all look the same, right? They all act the same. They all believe the same. They all look down on other people, and they all think they are part of the important, popular, in crowd. And what Jesus is saying is, look, what's going to happen after this party that guy's going to go throw a party. And he's going to try to make it bigger and better than this one. And he's just going to invite the same people who are already around the table. <laughs> and then after that party, this guy's going to throw a banquet. And he's going to try to outdo that party. And he's just going to invite the same people who are already around this table. What Jesus is saying is, what about this, guys? What if the next time you throw a party... Don't just invite people who are like you and who are going to return the favor. What if you actually invited in all the people who are like him? And I kind of picture in my mind that maybe Jesus is pointing outside 
or maybe the guy is still there looking in. I feel like Jesus is probably referencing the sick man and the dying man that everybody just walked over, and he said, hey, what if the next time you throw a party, we invite guys like him? Invite all the people, right, that you've pushed away and sent to the margins and excluded, and people that don't get invited to fancy banquets. What if you did that? What if you actually invited some people in here who don't get invited to parties? <laughs> what if you invited some people in who aren't going to be able to pay you back for what you've done? Those are the people that God loves and God values, right? Hey, what if we throw a party for some people that can't do anything for you in return? The people who go unnoticed, who don't get included, let's love them, let's serve them. And someday, Jesus says, you'll reap a huge reward for that. See, that's how you get elevated by God. Not just by walking in here and saying, we're the in crowd. And look at verse 15. Hearing this, a man sitting at the table with Jesus exclaimed, what a blessing it will be to attend a banquet in the kingdom of God. Now, don't be fooled by what he's saying here, okay? This is a traditional statement that they would say when they wanted to say, okay, we believe there will be people who are rewarded simply because they're part of the in crowd. It's us, right? We're in with God. And I think Jesus is going, okay, you're still not getting it. Let's say it this way. The guest list here is all wrong. The invites are all wrong. It's the poor, it's the suffering, it's the needy, it's the people in the margins. We have to make sure they're invited to the party. And here's Jesus, all right? Let me kind of just summarize some of the things he's getting ready to say. But he, he's going to tell a final story to just make sure that they get it. Let me tell you guys one, one final story to, to make sure you understand this. A guy was throwing a huge party. And he had a long guest list, but when it actually came time for people to show up to the party, they had a bunch of terrible, lame excuses on why they couldn't make it. And here's Jesus looking at these guys around the table who think they're the in crowd, and he says this, you're those guys. <laughs> you're the guys. But this guy was ready for a big party, right? So he said to his assistant... And it, I want to read this part of it. This is verse 21. Go quickly into the streets and the alleys of the town and invite the poor, the crippled, the blind, and the lame. After the servant had done this, he reported, there's still more room. So his master said, go out into the country lanes behind the hedges. Urge anyone you find to come so that the house will be full. What's the last word say right there? The house will be what? Full. full. For none of those I first invited will get even the smallest taste of my banquet. Here's Jesus, right? I don't know how this dinner party ends, by the way. I just think I love it up to this point. I don't know how it ends. He's driving home the point of the story and the experience that he's just had to say this. This dinner, right, and the guest list are really a mirror of how you guys feel about people on a spiritual level, too. You think people in the margins should stay in the margins. You think people who are not like you should stay out there so they don't affect you. But at this party, and the one he's talking about is a spiritual one, at my party, the one I'm going to throw, everyone is welcome and everyone is included. Now, that's the story. Okay, that's the story. I, I don't want you to miss what I think are two huge takeaways from this whole exchange, okay? And here's the first one. This story that happens to Jesus and he tells is a picture of what heaven will be like. I, I think that's one of the reasons he tells it. I, I want to tell you a story about what the greatest party, the biggest blowout banquet is going to be like. It, it's a picture of what heaven will be like. You know, most of the time, when you find a description of heaven in the Bible, it has a lot of things in common, right? There's, there's loud singing, there's feasting, there's drinking, it's, yeah, it's in there, there's dancing, and there's music. You find a lot of these common elements, right? It's all the things that you love about parties today, and then some. 
Can we say it that way? And, and then some. But here's what you don't get in heaven, right? It, it's great singing, but it's not karaoke. It's all the food you could hope for, but it's not gluttony. You got a full fountain of drinks, but not drunkenness. You, you've got dancing, not the chicken dance. You got music, you got music, but not country music. It's all the things that are great. Uh, all the things that are great that we love, and none of the deficiencies, all right? Now, wh why? Uh, because God wants a full party, everyone's welcome. Which means if you walked in here today and you're like, I don't know if I'm part of that crowd or not, you're invited. Everybody's invited. Everybody's included. Everybody's welcome to come to that banquet to be a part of that party. And the party invitation reads this way. You are invited to my party. Come as you are. Come as you are. You see, the guys around the table all agreed that there would be a heaven party someday. It was even possible for people to attend if you were good enough, like them, right? But here's what their invitation would say. Rather than come as you are, theirs would say, you've got to get changed and cleaned up, and then we might let you in. And as a result, people didn't come to them because they didn't think they were good enough. Number one, that, that right there, that story is a picture of what heaven will be like. But here's really where I want to land today, is that story is a picture of what earth should be like. It's a picture of what earth should be like. See, Jesus doesn't want to throw a party for popular people or good people or those who think they deserve a party. He throws parties for anyone and everyone, and maybe he even, maybe... Maybe he even tilts the scales in favor of those in the margins. Because I think he's also hoping that any chance that you and I have to recreate that scenario here on earth will be yet another picture of the party in heaven and a reflection, really, of God's heart for all people. Can we just net that out for a second? See, for me... It's this passage right here that really convicted me several years ago. Uh, as a pastor of a fairly young church plant, I'm reading this particular story right here, and at the end of it, I said, you know what we have to do? We have to throw a party for people who don't get invited to parties. We, we just have to do that. And this story right here led our, our church plant to do something back in 2010, and we we had a relationship that we had been forming with a local middle school that was pretty good. We had been serving there and getting to know people in the administration. And we were building a bridge between our church and that particular school. And so I met with the school one day and the guidance counselor. And I just simply said this. I said, who are the students in this middle school right now who need the most assistance? It's October. Who, who are the students here that when we get to... To, to the end of the year aren't really going to be able to have anything for Christmas. Like, like who's the lowest tier right here that needs the most help right now? We want to do something for them. We, we, we want to throw a Christmas party for them. And they gave me 20 names of students who were the lowest income level that they could identify. And uh, I, we, we just simply let them fill out a piece of paper. What, what is the greatest need that they have and someone helped them do that. Socks, underwear, clothes, a winter coat, that kind of thing. And then over here, what is a dream item you'd like to have this year for Christmas? And, and they gave us these pieces of paper. We, we had 20 names of students on the lowest income level. So on, on our side, back at the church, we, start, we simply start, started a dollar jar. And every week I would get up front and I would say, hey, if you're here today, I see you, would you just put $1 for you and every person in your family in that jar when you leave today. And we did this for October all the way up to, to Christmas. And I said, That's the, that money is going to help us throw this party, all right? So just throw your dollar in there. And, and um, we, we just had people jump on board and say, man, I, I want to be a part of that. I, I love this idea. And, and we had a local restaurant cater a meal for $2 a person. I thought, this is fantastic. 
um, we'll be a recurring customer if we can, you know. And I asked another church in our area who also ran a cafe to join us, and they decided to put up a Christmas tree in the front of their uh, a coffee shop, and we operated it like an angel tree, and we wrote kids' names on there and the gifts that they wanted, and people who were patrons of the coffee shop were buying the gifts for the kids, and they wrapped them, they brought them back and placed them under the tree, and I thought, this is awesome, you know. I don't have to shop even, you know. And... Uh, then someone who's not even a part of our church heard what we were doing, and they were inspired, and they wanted to be involved. And specifically, they wanted to, be so, they wanted to see something be done for the whole family that was coming to this dinner party. And th they wanted to be able to bless the families that were coming. They wanted us to provide something for them, a gift card for each family. They gave $1,500 to be used for this very specific purpose. And so we sent home invitations with the school. We followed up with phone calls directly to parents and grandparents. Before we knew it, those 20 students turned into 70 people. Mom, dad, grandma, grandpa, siblings, all kinds of people. The guidance counselor even came on the night of the event and helped. We arranged transportation. We literally rolled out a red carpet leading up to the front door that people could enter on. We did Christmas trivia and enjoyed live music. We took really nice family photos, printed them, and had them framed and gave them to the family before they left on that particular night. We catered the dinner. Our church people waited the tables, and we served people. We sang Christmas songs led by our band. Our kids got up and sang songs that they, they performed. We had dessert, and we passed out gifts. And, and, and you, you have these looks, right? The, the joy, you got the love, not because you got a pack of underwear or some socks, but someone got a bicycle, someone got a scooter, somebody got some things that they really asked for that they never thought that they were going to get. And 70 people came out to eat, enjoy an evening, have fun, receive gifts, and hopefully know what it feels like to be loved and get invited to a party when you don't normally get invited to parties. I mean, fantastic meal, family photos, gifts for every child, literally for dollars. That Christmas party, can we just say this? That Christmas party, according to Jesus, is a picture of what heaven will be like. Every dinner, right, every celebration, every party on earth where people in the margins get invited in, it's a picture of something greater. Can I, 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 I want that to be the one thing you walk out of here with today. When you invite people in who don't get invited in, it's a picture of something greater. It really represents the heart of Jesus for all people. It's a party for people who don't get invited to parties. Now, here's the real question, right, before you walk out of here is, well, what would it look like for you to do this? What would it look like for you to do this? I have a friend of mine from college. He leads a church of 12,000 people, all right? And yet most Tuesdays, you can see him standing on a street corner in downtown Lexington with a sign that says free hugs. <laughs> free hugs. He's been doing it for at least 10 years. His favorite spot is across from the courthouse. And, and as a part of their sentencing sometimes, the judge will say, when you go out that front door, you walk across the street and you see my friend John. That's part of your sentencing. <laughs> As part of their punishment, they give John a hug, and he just simply says this, I get a lot of side hugs from the men. <laughs> now, imagine if we all did this, right, or something like this. Why don't you throw a party? Why don't you take a party on the road to a nursing home, to a prison, to a school, to a shelter, wherever it is that you know there are people who tend to be excluded, a lunch table, a cul-de-sac, what if your family put their heads together and said, how can we do this? Or what if your family joined another family or, or your, your Sunday school class or your small group got together and said, all right, how, how can we love people in the margins? What if we found some other followers of Jesus in our neighborhood or at our work and we said, what might this look like if we did this? It, here's why. Can I just remind you of the bottom line again? Is that when we include people who are excluded... We're loving like God loves. Because every time people in the margins get included and loved and accepted by the followers of Jesus, it's the picture of a much bigger party to come. It's a reminder, really, that this right here is a lot like that. 
Now, I want to wrap up today just by praying for you on two different levels. And so let me just finish this way today. Do you guys normally stand when you sing the last song? Can I ask you guys just to go ahead and stand? You guys can prepare. Let me pray for us, and they're going to lead us uh, to respond in worship today. God, today I pray for uh, those in our room today. And maybe we came in knowing this, or maybe we've identified it since being here today. But we are those who have been pushed to the side. We are those who would say we're in the margins. We've been excluded at some point. That maybe we're on the outside looking in. And I just want to say I'm sorry for that. But God, today, we have the opportunity to respond to you because you're inviting us in. You've included us, God. You came for people like us. So I pray for those in the room today, God, that we would respond to the invitation that you have to come as we are, to bring what we've done, to bring what we uh, are, who we are, to come to you, to be received by you, to be welcomed in. God, I pray for those today who are on the outside looking in that we'd respond to you and your invitation. And God, I pray for those of us here today who have maybe placed other people in the margins. God, forgive us for doing that. Forgive us for maybe just looking the other way or simply overlooking people. God, help us to have eyes to see the people that you place in front of us. God, give us a heart to love the people that you love. God, give us a vision to simply find a way to invite them in. God, we thank you for including us. We thank you for inviting us in. We thank you for loving us. Help us to love other people today, God, the way that you love us. And we pray all this through Jesus. Amen.